please give a warm welcome for my friend, Eva Longoria. Hello. Well, and it's good to be here with you today, Eva, because we, um, we met this summer, mm -hmm. actually. And for the folks in the room that don't know, um, USC Annenberg's Inclusion Initiative was working on a Latinx study. Mm -hmm. And you were one of the first people I reached out to. And in true Eva Longoria fashion, she invited me to her house and said, we must discuss um, <laughs> within a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And so, so what I just wanted to do is I wanted to illustrate a couple of the, the key findings from the study mm -hmm. and talk to you about your reactions to our data and what's been happening around the country yeah. because yeah. you've been talking about this um, in a lot of different venues. And just for folks that maybe don't know. Um, well, well, first of all, I met sure. you last summer, but I've known of you for many, many years. Like if you want any statistic about something uh, <laughs> in the industry, you call Stacy at USC. And the first time I was aware of you was the women's study that you had mm -hmm. done yep. about female directors. Right. And, right. Um, and that was fascinating. And finally, a deep dive into a lot of the problems of why women aren't hired. Um, actually, just even the presenting of, oh, women aren't hired? Right. I think the right. people assumed, like, oh, women aren't. No, we're not. Right. As directors. And so that study was, was fascinating. And when you called to say, we're doing a Latinx study, I was like, yeah, somebody finally is, because um, once data is presented, mm -hmm. then we can better understand uh, how to navigate the problem. Right. Yeah. And, and what was really interesting, too, is working in the, the female director space in particular, AFI is at 51%, I believe, female-directed content this <laughs> festival. And for the first time ever, the percentage of female directors across the top 100 films um, from 4% is projected to be between 12 and 14% this year. So it's the first time we've actually seen an uptick in the history that we've been working on this topic. So we know change is possible, and I want to keep mm -hmm. that spirit mm -hmm. in what we're talking about today. Yeah. Change is possible, but it's, it's like that uh, b we keep celebrating upticks right. as opposed to equality. And that's why I hate when studios give themselves such a pat on the back for increasing 100% their directors. Like, we had, we didn't hire one, we hired two! Right, right. We doubled the number of female directors, and you're like, you have two! That's not an improvement. Indeed. And so we have to keep on it, because right. sometimes studios hide behind these press releases mm -hmm. of, uh, of word magic. You know, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, so-and-so's leading the way for female directors. You're like, yeah, because you have four. Right, <laughs> right. Which is the most of any other studio. So I want, us, I want us to stay on top of that. Right. And and typically, I am very pessimistic in this space, so it's a new coat for me to be wearing of optimism. <laughs> so I'm glad you're tempered about it. So, so let's take a downturn to where I'm more comfortable um, and talk a little bit about what we found with Latinx representation. And just so that folks know, we look at the top 100 films every year, and across almost 50,000 speaking characters and 1,200 movies, only 4%, 4.5% of all on-screen characters Characters um, are Hispanic or Latino, and when we look to leads, um, the percentage uh, is equally problematic. Only three percent of roles. And I remember, you know, at your kitchen table, telling you that, okay, while well, there are about half of all of these leads or co-leads are women, five are accounted for by Cameron Diaz of the 17 female Latinas um, across 1,200 movies. And so this is really an inclusion crisis in many respects. And so I wanted to ask you, because Eva's been going around the country and around the world talking about this data, what was your initial reaction? And what have been individuals' reactions to you uh, sounding the alarm on just how problematic these findings are? Well, I think I really applaud you all for um, calling it the erasure of Latinx. Like the study was called the erasure of Latinx. That's a very powerful word because what happens is um, we keep using underrepresentation, um, which just means you don't, you're not equal to our population. We're 18% of the American population, but we're 3% in film, we're 5% in TV. Um, and what happens is you're erasing a culture when you are not represented in the media. And on top of that, if you look at the news and um, maybe our current administration, you see uh, the defining of Latino culture as one thing, illegal, um, uh, criminal, uh, gangster, 
a cartel. And so in, in, if you look at those 3% of roles, how many of those roles were cartel leaders? How many of those roles were negative portrayals? And so what happens is the media educates communities about who we are. So if you live in Alabama in a town that does not have a Latino, you are educated by movies, you're educated by television, and you assume, oh, that's what they are, because that's, I don't know one, um, and that's who they are, and uh, that's a negative thing. But what's even more damaging is it educates our community about who we are. So if our young Latinos and Latinas and Latinx people um, only see that representation on screen, then they will aspire to only be so much. And so we have to, we have to show more. And that's really um, why the word erasure is really important because it's more serious than, um, there's not enough of us on TV. It has societal effects. There's an, a wonderful activist named Fabiana Rodriguez. I don't know if you guys know her, artist, activist, amazing. And she's, she speaks all over the world about how culture has to change policy. Culture has to change before you change um, politics and policies, and um, if we're going to change anything, if you look at the Defense of Marriage Act, she talked about how um, 10 years before gay marriage passed, what was on TV? Will and Grace, um, Ellen, Ellen came out on TV, and then 10 years later, gay marriage passed. If you look at um, the Cuban refugee crisis in the 60s, um, you know, Cubans were were welcomed to come into this country, and if you look at what was on TV ten years before that, it was Desi Arnaz, mm -hmm. right? And they're like, oh my God, if our Cubans are like that, come on in. Um, and so, uh, TV and 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 film has a really strong impact on policy, and so we have to con we have to create the narrative in Hollywood so that we can change policy for the everyday Latinos who are working, um, hardworking people in this country. So mm -hmm. when you've been talking about this in the industry, when you talk about data like this in your industry meetings, what's the response um, from industry executives, from agents? Uh, what do they say when you bring up these alarming statistics? Um, yeah, because there's. I'm glad you said there's many facets to our industry. There's agents, there's executives at studios, there's marketing arms of, of studios. There's many different different realms in uh, in in this issue. And so um, every studio will tell you we are look we're dying for Latino content. We're like oh my gosh we just we just really want it. And the problem is they'll usually develop it. Mm -hmm. They'll hire a Latino that comes in and pitches La Llorona, mm -hmm. and they'll develop it, right. but like, will they make it? And, and what an happens is, distinction. it's a very important distinction in TV and in film. So they get to check the box when they turn in their reports and data at the end of the year, the, did you hire Latinos? Yep, yep, I hired Lupe and I hired Jose. <laughs> uh, but did you make what Lupe wrote and Jose wrote? Oh. Well, you know, the, the, the development process, we ended up making five more Marvel movies. And you're like, well, then you didn't do the job. You didn't take it over the finish line. Mm -hmm. And that's um, the frustrating part when talking to studios and executives and co content creators is because um, we need this pipeline of storytellers and they can only get so far. One, because a lot of times uh, they're unproven. And so you've never had a Latino show run, run a show who's a writer. You've written scripts and you may have been on staff, but have you run a show? And they, you go, well, no. And so they usually don't go with unproven people. And then it's the, it's the chicken or the egg, right? Like, I can't prove to you I can do it until you let me do it. Right. <laughs> And so the risk adversity of studios, but them, you know, at every panel, you know, you'll see it at every panel, them going, you know, we're really committed to diversity. Right. <laughs> and uh, I actually wanted to do a drinking game at the last. I love that summit idea. I was at to see how many people use the word diversity on a panel and you would have to take a shot. Um, <laughs> because it's such a buzzword. And um, so that's the frustrating thing. Um, I think what agents say is, oh, the talent's just not there. And that bugs me too, right. <laughs> because right. uh, you haven't tapped into this talent pool the way you should. You're not seeking it. And again, the chicken or the egg, well, how can you find talent if they're not getting the roles? There are no roles, and so um, 
it's it's frustrating on that end as well to get representation for for a lot of these uh, uh, people who have amazing talent but not the experience. Right. And what I think is really fascinating about that is that one of the things we looked at in the report is 77 percent, 77 percent of states um, and territories in the U.S. have more. Hispanic Latinos than what we see in Hollywood films. So the complete disconnect to say the talent's not there, they haven't even tried. And, and I have a couple of numbers I put together for you just to get your reaction to because you're a businesswoman and you're presenting the business case when you go in, right, with your shows. And, and fascinating, if we look across the last 12 years, Latino leads receive median $31 million less for production costs than non-Latino leads. So they're not supported in the same way. They're five million less in median domestic and international marketing spend. So they're not supported in terms of visibility and they're distributed in fewer international territories. And if you look at films with solo leads, only four films with a Latino solo lead in the last 12 years were released in China which we know is the lever for generating international revenue, right, and creating a sea change in the industry. So how do you build the case about the Latino audience to ensure that when you take a film, when you take a, a TV show, and who you have to pitch it to, how do you build that case um, when you know that they're not going to be supported like films by other storytellers, simply because of their identity, not the prowess of the story. Well, that's a twofold. I think there's two uh, people at fault for that. The first one is, it, you're right, it's, it's not a moral imperative, not only a moral imperative. Like I said, we have to change society with the media, and that's, there's a moral imperative we should have representation. Uh, but it's, it's, it makes economic sense. I mean, mm -hmm. Latinos are still the, one of the largest media uh, moviegoers in the country. Um, it's still one of the uh, number one forms of entertainment for Latino families. So right. instead of going to a baseball game, they'd rather all go to a movie. Instead of going to the theater, uh, my family would all rather go see a movie together. Mm -hmm. Four tickets. That's still, right. in, in most cases, the cheapest form also of entertainment for families. Um, so, you know, Latinos, we're going, ev we're going to see everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that... Uh, you have to service um, your customer, and that's not happening in a way in which it should. The second part is Latinos need to show up. Mm -hmm. Like when I did Dora, I was I was like, this is an iconic character. Dora is amazing. It was an amazing movie. Um, mind you, that was a a tough weekend for Latinos. Mm -hmm. We had the El Paso shooting and uh, the Mississippi ice raid. So I think a lot of Hispanics were like, I'm not leaving my house, right? right? Um, but, uh, you know, we had Grand Hotel on ABC, um, and we didn't over-index with Latinos, mm -hmm. and it was a full Latino cast, the only one on broadcast television. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you remember the George Lopez show back in the day? Right. Um, that got canceled because of ratings. One Day at a Time got canceled from Netflix because because we're not showing up. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. If we, you know, we are not a monolithic group, and I and I understand that. I'm Mexican American. My husband's Mexican. My best friends from Spain. My my uh, other best friends from Puerto Rico. And we don't watch the same things because we didn't grow up the same way. But we are united by a lot more um, language and food and traditions and values. I mean, there's way more that unites us. And I think a lot of times. Uh, uh, Latino audiences want to go. Well, that's a that's a salsa movie. I don't. I didn't even grow up listening to salsa. I don't want to see the Celia Cruz biopic. I didn't grow up with. It. Go see it. <laughs> Just go see it. Right. You know. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, George Lopez is Mexican American. He's Chicano. I'm Puerto Rican. It's like s watch it, support it. Well, one day at a time is about a Cuban. I don't really uh, relate to that. It's all universal themes. It's about family and love and parenting and, and divorce and relationships. And uh, there's beautiful themes that all of these shows deal with. You know, Grand Hotel was a soap. If you like soaps, go see a soap. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so that's, I think, uh, I want a wake-up call to Latino audiences to go out and support films and support opening weekends the way the African community does. I mean, they do a wonderful job um, when there's uh, African-American leads in a movie or, or when it deals with the content of their, their communities. Um, they do it in a really big way, and I, I would love that unity in our audience as well. I want to know why aren't, they, why aren't we showing up for each other? Well, and, and I think one of the issues of getting more content made for particular audiences is making sure there's authenticity behind the camera. And you've had this amazing uh, body of work as a director primarily in television. And you're set to make history behind the camera in film because we know across 1,200 films in the last 12 there years, there's been one Latina as a director across those movies. And you now, what's that? In studio films, right. So Patricia Regan, that's it. So, so you're, you're now tapped with 24-7, right, with, with Kerry Washington. Um, it's a comedy at uh, Universal Studios with starring Kerry Washington right. that I'm directing. Yeah. Right. And, and you also have a film at Fox, right? Fox Searchlight. Yeah, yeah. and it's Flaming Hot, correct? Hot Flaming Hot, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. tell us Which a little bit. Which is an amazing bit. story, I just have to say. I don't know if you guys know the Flaming Hot Cheeto, right? Yeah. How many eat Flaming Hot Cheetos? Like... If you're Hispanic, you definitely eat Flaming Hot Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> well, the man who invented it, which I didn't even know this story until I read the script, and I was like, how do I not know this story? And that's a problem, that I don't know mm -hmm. this story. Uh, and it was the janitor that worked in the factory at Frito-Lay, invented Flaming Hot Cheetos. And he was told, you know, he couldn't read or write when he got the job. Mm -hmm. He would clean the machines, and he kept saying, I have this idea, I have this idea. Oh, Richard, you know, I ideas don't come from people like you. Um, you know, I, I want to present this to some no, people don't listen to people like you don't, you know, you know, you think you have a million dollar idea. This is not a, you know, and he did not have a million dollar idea. He had a billion dollar idea mm -hmm. and it is still the number one product of Frito-Lay hmm. Flaming Hot Cheetos because of the Latino uh, market. And so mm -hmm. he, his story, but by the way, him creating the Hot Cheeto is not even the story, his journey in life is one of the most beautiful pursuits of happiness you, you will see on the screen. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to show that because we need stories like that mm -hmm. um, that show perseverance and, and hardworking uh, Latinos who are doing great things. Mm -hmm. How difficult was it for you to get attached as the director of those movies, right? I mean, you have this amazing body of work, but moving from television to yeah. film is often like moving from documentary to narrative filmmaking, yeah. right? There's this invisible barrier. Mm -hmm. So what did it take to hop or break that barrier? Um, how easy or difficult was it? Very difficult. I mean, I think they, Searchlight had said they hadn't seen this many directors on any film they've ever, uh, you know, out. So they've, they saw, S they they auditioned so many directors and I I I think I got the job because of my authenticity to the story and the voice. This man was Mexican American. I'm Mexican American. He's Chicano. I'm Chicana. Um, I understand straddling the hyphen of Mexican American. I sit on it every day. People go, oh, you're half Mexican, half American. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm a hundred percent Mexican and a hundred percent American at the same time. <laughs> so it's not. You know, you don't get to decide right. when you turn one off. And, um, and navigating life through this identity, because being in America, people go, oh, she's Mexican. And every time I go to Mexico, because I'm married to a Mexican, um, even my husband's like, stop saying you're Mexican. Because he's like, you're not Mexican. And I'm like, I am Mexican. <laughs> uh, but when I go to Mexico, they're like, oh, there's the gringa, there's the American. And so not being accepted in either world is hard to navigate. And, uh, and so... It's um, a big point of his story, too. And so when I went in and I said, look, this is the voice. This is what I want to do. Um, and it was difficult for me to get the job because I, again, don't have the body of chicken or the egg. I don't have the body of work in which I'm pitching. I'm saying, I'm going to do this movie, and it's going to be like this, and I'm going to shoot it like this, and the story's going to be like this, and this is what we're going to do, and this is what we're going to cast. And they loved my idea, but they were like, have you, you know, where's, where's your resume that you've done this? And so if Evil Longoria has that problem in a room, imagine 
the unknown actress or the unknown screenwriter or the unknown director who also has the talent but doesn't have the body of work to prove that they have that talent. And so, um, you, you know, I'm just a, a good salesperson, I think, and I can, I bent their arm to hire me. I may, yeah. <laughs> I was like, you will hire me. This is my movie. But I will tell you, I had a great piece of advice from Brian Tannen. Brian Tannen wrote um, Grand Hotel. He was a showrunner. And I practiced my pitch over and over and over with him about, you know, I was like, Okay, and then and then I, I would like to do this, and I think I think I want to do this, and I and then I want to uh, you know I want to ask him if this, and he goes, I gotta stop you right there. I gotta stop you, and I was like, what? And he said, I want you to start your pitch over and put your white male privilege pants on, <laughs> and talk as if you are doing the movie. So I'm going to shoot the movie like this. I'm going to cast so and so. I'm going to shoot it this way. I kept asking for permission in my presentation and he's like do you know how many men go in and say this is what I'm gonna do and that's it there's no presentation there's no you know and he was like you're much more prepared than anybody and and you're asking for permission to do the movie you should say you're lucky if you get me you know and really really shifting my my headspace and walking into a room and owning the room and going this is my job I don't know if you guys know that but this is my job this is I'm gonna get this um, and it really I think that's what pushed me over the edge. I think they said, oh my God, she has so much, we have so much confidence in her executing what she wants to do. Um, but I didn't initially have that until some a white male man told me that. <laughs> and did, did Searchlight um, facilitate the Universal deal with 24-7 or was it the opposite order? No, um, I, I actually, Universal, let me tell you something. This is also for women. This is about sisterhood. And, you know, since Time's Up and Me Too, we've had this amazing sisterhood in Hollywood. Indeed. Um, and Carrie Washington and I have known each other 20 years. And um, we developed this idea together and we went to Universal and they said, we love it, let's do it. And we were interviewing directors and we kept not really finding the right one. Nobody really pitched us the right tone and we really wanted it executed a certain way. And all along the way, Carrie Washington kept saying, why don't you direct it? And I was like, no, I don't want to direct it because I'm in it and, and it's hard, but I don't want, I no, 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 we need like Paul Feet. <laughs> like we need like, the comedy guy, the comedy girl, whoever that is. And we would interview more directors and we weren't finding the director and she's like, why don't you do this? And she said it over and over. Finally, I was like, I was just like, I don't know. I don't know why I didn't even think about myself to do it. Mm -hmm. And so we go into Universal and I pitch my version of the movie. And if it wasn't for Carrie being in the room also, because Carrie's been directed by Ava DuVernay, she's been directed by Quentin Tarantino, she's been directed by Spike Lee. And she went in there and said, I've been directed by all these amazing people and there's not one better director than Eva to do this job. And to have that like support and sisterhood, I don't think I would have gotten the job if it wasn't for Carrie vowing for my talent because she had seen it, she's witnessed it, she knows it, she's been with me on my, my directing journey. And so if anybody is in a position of power here, that's what you have to do. It's more than mentoring, but there's a, there's a thing called mentoring and you give advice. Sponsoring is a different thing. So sponsoring means opening that door and, and doing what Carrie did for me for somebody else. So if you are ever in that position, you have to do that for your, your colleagues, your fellow women, your fellow uh, Latinos, I think that's that's key and important. Well, and that's something that we've seen with, with Time's Up, right? A real sisterhood, right? When I email you or you email me, there's an immediate response. And, and Angela Robinson often talks about, you need your wing person. You need your wing person in the room with you. Yeah. And, and this is a testament of what activism does. It brings people together mm -hmm. and we know that inclusion and the best product happens when people from very different backgrounds come together mm -hmm. in decision making for a product. Yeah. Not only that, for time, the Time's Up movement as well for women, uh, our whole lives, even not even in this industry, in our lives, you are, we as women are taught there's only room for one, mm -hmm. right? And so if I'm that woman, I'm like, nobody else is getting in because I got this seat and oh my gosh, this is like, there's only room for one. Uh, same with Hispanics. There's only room for one. There's mm -hmm. only, you know, one Hispanic on, on the show. And so, you know, and so it alienates us and it insulates us to be, um, you know, siloed in our efforts, in our negotiations, mm -hmm. in our search for whatever roles we want to do. And once Time's Up happened, it broke all those barriers down mm -hmm. and we go, oh my gosh, there's more room than just one. It's, mm -hmm. it's 
there's room for all of us. And now we do call each other like, how much did you get for that movie? Because they're trying to tell me they've never paid somebody that. Right. And they're <laughs> like, let me tell you, the industry is like, uh oh, they're talking. <laughs> they're talking to each other. What do we do? Right. I mean, I will I call Natalie Portman and I said, what what did you do in this case? You know, Brie Larson, Larson just said, hey, I'm hiring an exec and the studio is telling me this, this, this. Is that true? And Reese you know, Reese Witherspoon jumps in on our chain and she's like, that's not true. And let me tell you, and we're like, great. Like we have access <laughs> to n this knowledge that we right. didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And it's been um, really amazing to be a part of uh, because we had been uh, taught that that wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. So I want to go back before we open it up to questions, and I'm hoping somebody is um, following the time because I am, in fact, not. Uh, I could just do this for a while. Um, uh, I want to go back to this summer because something really powerful happened in response to El Paso. Um, there was a letter uh, because I want to turn to a few solutions when we think about how do we change an industry and, and what what is the origin of the letter? So tell us a little bit about the letter that came after El Paso, and secondly, the creation of Latinx House. And what is the Latinx House, and what does it plan to achieve? Because I think there's a through line of unification that is so powerful in what's going on with Monica uh, and Olga and Alex. So, so maybe take us a little bit through the how everyone came together so powerfully this well, summer. Well, I'll tell you, you know, one of my other dear friends, America Ferreira, who's like my, my sister in arms because she's an intense activist and she's just so articulate on every issue and she's always the first one to call. Um, you first one you would call and the first one that calls you for like, we gotta do something. And so she called and she said, you know, we wanna do this letter called Querida Familia and um, let the Latino community know they're not alone, and it was really that. All it was was a love letter to say, um, you're not alone, because the El Paso shooting really hit home for me as a Texan, not only as a Texan, but to have somebody have a manifesto that hates Mexicans or hates the Hispanic invasion of America was taught that by media and by somebody and by people. And um, it was just such a, a dangerous, um, rhetoric that is out there right now and we have to combat that hate with love and it's like that's like a lofty thing to say but like hate is a very active thing people can hate and, and it feels active but love is just as strong and so we were uh just reaching out to our latino brothers and sisters to say we will continue to fight for you and we're here and you're not alone and and we got 250 activists actors singers um, politicians, executives, to sign this letter saying, we are behind you and this community to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I, I don't know a lot about Latinx House, but it's amazing. <laughs> so I don't, I'm not the person to talk okay. on it. You could probably say more about the Latinx I House. Could, it is but a I'm space let them. being yeah. created um, where they're bringing in speakers and we just hosted, Latinx just hosted um, the CHC, um, who came into town, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, to uh, talk about this uh, uh, erasure of Latinx in the industry and what could they do on a, on a government level, public level. Um, and so there was a lot of ideas thrown around, but it's really a, a, a space to exchange uh, ideas and how we can better um, unite our, our culture and prove to this country that we are woven into the fabric that, that it's created on. And I think that um, this will be my last question, then we'll go to, to folks that might have questions for you. Um, you did something really extraordinary lately. In I had a baby. Uh, no. <laughs> Though Santiago is adorable. <laughs> He's adorable. That's the most extraordinary thing I've ever done. Well, so I don't know what you're going to talk yeah. about. Um, <laughs> because often we measure ourselves against what we see other people doing and say to ourselves, would I be capable of doing that? And you were at the Fortune Conference not too long ago, and there was a speaker there that was contested uh, for her um, deplorable stance of, of how she's treated people in this country. And I was hoping you might tell us a little bit about that conference what you walked into and what you chose to do because our voices matter. And so I wanna put you on the spot to tell that story because 
that mobilized me as an activist, and I'm hoping it will mobilize them because when it comes to Latinx and really advocating, we have to all use our voices. And this is something that you did that was not only courageous, but I think sent a very strong message to all of us, our voices matter. So tell us about that conference. Yeah, well, um, I don't know if y'all remember the Homeland, um, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Kirsten Nielsen, who was responsible for the family separations, who was responsible for the policies at the border. She's responsible for putting kids in cages. This woman, her, this is gonna be her legacy, is putting babies in cages. And uh, I was speaking at the Fortune Women's Summit and they announced she was going to be speaking as well. And Hillary Clinton pulled out. Um, some, uh, many people started pulling out of the conference because they invited her. And I was like, I'm not pulling out. I'd rather challenge her and debate her about her ideas. Because if I pull out, now she's the only voice in the room. Mm -hmm. So she's the only one that gets the microphone. And I had so many people call me to pull out. I had a lot of you know, uh, or Latino organizations saying, you can't take that stage. You're going to be uh, endorsing her. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm taking the stage to uh, challenge her and her ideas about um, why she did that. And, and she spoke the day before I got there, and uh, God bless the, the interviewer who was on stage with her because she really pressed her for answers. And, and she sem seemed to be on some kind of redemption tour, like, oh, okay, that was my past. And, but she was totally unapologetic, and she was saying, I just followed the laws. And unfortunately, she doesn't know what the laws are. I mean, seeking asylum is not breaking the law. And so I just, I decided to go and speak about it. And my panel was about diversity in Hollywood and it just completely <laughs> turned into, uh, you know, uh, just a, a speech against um, all these policies that are happening, happening against the border and, and um, how we've lost humanity in how we treat um, people who are coming to this country um, for the sole sake of wanting to better their own lives. I mean, they're, seek, they're, they're, they're fleeing these immigrants are fleeing the most intense trauma you can think of, um, and yet they come to our doors and face even more trauma by our borders. That's that's unbelievable to me, and so I, I just um, decided to not put down my microphone. I didn't want to. Um, I didn't want her to take my voice away, and so I just decided to stay in it and talk about it. Um, yeah, that was that. Okay, I, I lied. I have to ask you one more question based yes. on that answer. You were mentored by someone extraordinary, Dor Dolores Huerta, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so, so in terms of your own personal activism mm -hmm. and your own approach to creating change, whether it's Hollywood, whether it's with your foundation for Latinas in STEM based on your own master's degree mm -hmm. thesis and the work you did, what did Dolores teach you early on oh, about yeah. your voice and your vision, particularly as we think changing Hollywood when it comes to Latinx. Mm -hmm. She, it's so funny, because I've, I've known Dolores. I moved to Hollywood and, and I uh, was immediately in, in this um, farm worker cohort. Like it was just all my friends worked before, were the, worked for UFW or worked for MALDEF, which is the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. I wasn't famous, by the way. I was like a struggling actor and I've got to witness Dolores and I just volunteered a lot and, and they asked me to, to do some things and Dolores, I just remember clearly Dolores going, what are you, what are you gonna do? And I said, I'm an actress, I'm gonna be an actress. And she said, well, one day you're gonna have a voice so you better have something to say. And I was like, why would I have a voice? I mean, <laughs> not knowing the, the platform I would have, uh, you know, 15 years later, and um, she's just, you know, an amazing human being. She's one of our, in the Latino community, you know, she's actually not even just the Latino community, she's one of the last living civil rights icons. I mean, she's, she's almost gonna be 90 and she's still out there. I, I don't know how many times she's been arrested, um, you know, for great causes. Um, she's just a, a dynamite of a human being and she's the one that actually led me on my academic path of pursuing my master's and she introduced me to so many academics in this field and, and introduced me to Chicano studies and um, and that's what I got my master's degree in because I wanted to know more about immigration and she was talking about the dismantling of all the rights that they achieved in the 60s that they're no longer there. Things as simple as water for farm workers, shade and breaks. Like the fact that you have to fight for as a, as a farmer, you should provide water, shade, and breaks for your workers. 
was dismantled and like pulled back and it was like oh my gosh what this is happening and there's so I always had questions for her and she was like she gave me a book she always led me to different people um so I could I was just so curious about it and and she's she's been still I will see her tonight she's at my foundation dinner tonight speaking she's amazing That's amazing <laughs> amazing and you know it was I in doing research on you you came to Los Angeles with 22 dollars in my bank account I didn't even know the bank account was to stay open with 22 dollars all right <laughs> and it it's really an illustration of how voices matter right and it's just an amazing journey and i call myself blessed and lucky to be your friend it's really extraordinary i'm happy i'm uh, lucky to know you well <laughs> so let's take a couple of questions i think we have a few minutes for that um uh, i don't know if there's a, a microphone that can run okay great so right down here um actually let's start in the 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 person in the back and then we'll move one row up so right here yeah mm -hmm. thank you thank you so much for all your work Yvonne for speaking with such strong conviction when you do speak about these issues um I want to know like at what point did you start like finding your voice in being an activist in your industry um well you know my activism started when I was young. I come from a very philanthropic family. My oldest sister is special needs. She has a mental disability. And so my mom became a special education teacher because of my sister. And um, so my earliest memories are Special Olympics. Like I remember being a, a hugger at the Special Olympics. Like my mom would make us all volunteer because my sister Lisa was in the Special Olympics. And then we would go to the Salvation Army and my mom would make us all volunteer because my sister was uh, at, at that place. We would go to the Boys and Girls Club and we had to volunteer in order for my sister to uh, participate in any of the programs. And so um, that word volunteerism was introduced very early in my life and I thought it was a job. I was like, when do we get paid? Um, <laughs> and uh, and I was, I was really lucky for that gift uh, from, from my family. But I remember every Thanksgiving, we would go to the homeless shelters and we would feed the homeless first. And my dad would say, you know, if you're hungry, imagine them. And um, it was just all these like lessons constantly, constantly. So I always knew I would be an activist. Um, the fact that I got this amazing opportunity um, after Desperate Housewives to, to have the stage that I had and be able to say more um, was when I actually had to get laser focused about it because um, I had always been doing everything. I mean, people, there was, you know, dolphins in Japan. We have to save the dolphins. I'm like, oh my God, we gotta save the dolphins. And then, uh, you know, there's AIDS in Africa. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a big problem. AIDS in Africa, we gotta do that. And then there was sex trafficking in Thailand. I'm like, we've got to save the children in Thailand. Like it was, everything was so important. And um, I was getting hundreds of requests a week to do different things and uh, I finally was like I can't I can do I can do anything but I can't do everything and that's when I started focusing on who what community could I make effective sustainable change and I knew it wanted to be the Latino community and I knew I wanted it to be women and so my foundation focuses on Latinas through educational programs and entrepreneurial programs but that's how it, it really got laser focused because I couldn't do everything and I wanted to make enough change with somebody um, yeah, that's how it started. My mom <laughs> <laughs> and my sister. Okay, how about right here, sir? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Unbelievable Productions is the name of my of my company. Yeah, my producing partner's here, Ben. Um, you guys can attack him after. <laughs> <laughs> Give him your ideas. Uh, but no, you know, it, it's it's. I've always been a producer director turned actor. People think, oh, you're an actor, di actor turned director. But I, in my head, I've always been behind the scenes. I've always been fascinated with, with uh, controlling the final product that you get to put out there. And just by default, um, we started getting a lot of uh, Latino content. Latino writers come to us, Latino directors come to us um, because of what I've produced in the past. And it's just my perspective and my storytelling. You know, I produced, we produced Telenovela, I produced um, um, Grand Hotel, we produced Devious Maids. Um, and it was, uh, we're producing, uh, it was just announced today, uh, Aron Sanchez's um, book, Where I Came From. Um, we're making that into a TV show. And so we kind of uh, have found this really great 
niche of, tr of, of that. You know, Flaming Hot is a good example of like, that's the things I want to make, is just really great positive stories of triumph and, and achieving the American dream. And um, I want to see uh, people like me on screen, you know, brown skinned, brown hair, <laughs> brown eyes, uh, um, because I don't see enough of it. But that's really, you know, producing with purpose, which is the purpose of expanding everybody else's minds to, to who we are as a community. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> Gentleman right here, who's been very patient, by the way. Hello, it's good to speak with you again. I remember we met at the R RBG uh, screening that you had, so. Um, without, like, I don't know about raw statistics, but when you... Well, Stacy will know it. Uh, <laughs> when you think, when you look at the bulk of roles presented to Latin actors in America, what percent would you say do not involve drugs, immigration, or some kind of servant class position? Very few. Actually, if you look in our study, uh, we did a qualitative analysis. The lead author that really took um, uh, control of that is here, Ariana Case. Where are you, Ariana? Um, little hand. I wanted you to meet Eva, too, so this is great. Um, Ariana did a lot of the qualitative work to actually answer that question. It turns out that a focus on immigration, a focus on criminality, whether it's all speaking characters, right? And a typical film has 40 characters. So, so a lot of these are just characters that say one or two words that are being cast in a very negative light. Those same trends are mirrored with leading characters, and we break them down uh, in the in the um, report. The other thing that's really problematic is oftentimes you see Latinx characters um, isolated, where they are in fact the only one in the story, and they're not linked to their community. And so, so there's a real lack of authenticity across the board. So it's not only negative portrayals, but also an isolation um, that's akin to this invisibility and erasure that Eva spoke about later. But for in-depth questions, please ask Ariana because also, she led the charge. Where can they find the study? Can they just um, it It's online? on the USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative website, um, and we can give you uh, a link um, afterwards if, if you want to uh, stick around or folks can Google that information. But it's very consistent. And we haven't stepped into streaming and TV. That's next. Uh, because I, I'm not sure that it's too terribly different. Um, there's just a lot more content, right? Which we need to be smart about the activism. If we just say increase visibility and we don't focus on representation, we're creating a more problematic situation for the industry. And that's exactly what we saw with activism for female characters in the TV space. Everybody said circa 2006, 2007, more females, more females, female, more objectification, more hypersexualization, and more portrayals that were problematic. So we really have to tackle this two-fisted. Go on this side. Yeah. Where I get a little confused is that because I don't have any doors open and I'm also come from like Mexican culture, your values, so I was <laughs> always taught to be nice and polite, so it's been tougher for me to kind of like be more cutthroat and get in there. So I never know how to like either get in there or should I just post it on YouTube? Because I get nervous of like, oh no, should I put my pilot on or should I wait to have it produced the right way, you know, because we, we want it to look how you want it to look, how you were saying, like my vision, my story. And I've noticed that a lot of my stories are very bilingual, very how I grew up, but also just a lot of comedy because it comes from tragedy. So they're, they're more lighthearted, but I'm like, oh, but I don't want it to be super, oh yeah, because she's Latin and she struggled. And I'm like, no, actually I came from a great family but I just want to show that I actually struggled here in LA. And here's where I didn't know where I fit in or anything. So I struggled with like, should I just put it out there and just do YouTube or more classes or I don't know, like kind of where to start to break in. I, uh, well, first you're uh, uh, way ahead of the game. Um, because you've, you've done something. My favorite is like meeting somebody who goes, I'm a writer. And I say, what have you written? They go, well, not yet. 
You know, if you are a writer, write something. If you are a director, direct something. I don't care if it's on your iPhone. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, do what you say you're doing. Um, and so that's great that you did that. I would put it out yesterday. Like, you just put it out there. You know, uh, Lena Dunham, before she did Girls, Girls was based on a short film she had done called Little Chair, what was it? Tiny, tiny, tiny furniture. Yeah. So it wasn't like she got an opportunity to do girls. It was like another version of her life. And it was totally her perspective, a millennial outlook on living today in New York. And it was very specific. And I think specificity is the point. You sh your stuff should be bilingual if you're bilingual. Um, there's an amazing writer, Linda Chavez. She uh, show runs uh, Gentified on Netflix, which hasn't come out yet. I think it comes out in February. Um, she's written two scripts, but um, she's rewriting uh, uh, Flaming Hot for us. And she really found a niche voice. Like if you read her scripts, you go, oh, that's Linda Chavez, because she does that Mexican-American voice really well. Like there's a cadence to our language, there's a cadence to how we speak. You know, we, are, we speak in Spanglish, um, we have different words. I mean, and she just nails it. And she said she realized um, you can only write what you know. And she thought, I'm never gonna work because all I know is my neighborhood, my family, um, my culture, and some, a writer mentored her and said, write that. That's what you should write. And so um, you don't have to be cutthroat. You have to be authentic. And um, yeah, just keep creating content. Work begets work. And so I remember when I was a struggling actress, I took every student film. I took every, do you remember backstage, wet, the, dia the, the, news, the p actual paper? Yeah. <laughs> and I would look for student films just because I wanted tape on myself. And I would go and drive everywhere. And I'd submit myself on auditions. You just do it. And you figure it out. Because there's no recipe. You can do exactly what I did, and it won't work. And you can do exactly what somebody else did, and it won't work. Because you have to create your own success and uh, you know when I moved here I didn't say I'm gonna give myself three years I mean it was just this is what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be good at it and I'm gonna do it um, so yeah I mean I think it's great that you've already done that much you're way ahead of the game mm -hmm. I just saw the sign I think we have time for one very short last question so if somebody promises that it's short um, <laughs> Uh, or else the yeah. woman to my right will uh, kill me. So how about this gal right here? Yes. <laughs> so um, I'm a, I went to UCLA, and I uh, got my MFA in screenwriting. And I made a lot of connections there. I was also the only Latina in the group. I'm from El Paso, Texas. And in this landscape of having no agents and having to find managers, how do people like us, who actually can write, mm -hmm. and have written, and have produced shorts, and who are needed, you know, and who are, yes, oh who my are gosh, needed. this whole writer agent thing is a mess. Yeah. And yes. we were just talking about this yesterday because we're saying the people who are hurting the most are people who don't have the experience. Because writers' rooms right now, there's what 500 scripted shows in yeah. production. Right? It's something Plus. insane, yeah. and writers can't uh, showrunners need bodies they're like do you write great come on like who ugh. and what's happening is they're only hiring who they know because they can't go through agents right now yes. um and so it is a problem and i i um i think that you know networking being here um you know networking is the only way to do it right now uh i don't know what is going to happen because i think it's going to get worse yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah it's only going to get worse for writers uh and specifically writers of color, it's, it's gonna be hard. But what I will tell you is keep writing, keep writing and submitting your specs to send them to production offices. If you wanna write yes. for you know, Love, Simon on Disney Plus, send it to the production office and, and they sort things there and they get things. But you know, I, I don't know what else they, Ben, do you have an answer for that? Give Ben the microphone. Uh-oh. No, I think um, it's get your material to people. Send scripts to cold call, you know, cold send them to managers and lawyers and, and, yeah. and to, like she said, to, to production companies that are making the show that you want to be on, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that's the best way. If, you're, if your work's good, it will get attention. It'll rise. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I am looking forward to a really extraordinary 2020 watching you continue to rise. Mm -hmm. Everyone, please join me in thanking Thank Eva you. Thank Longoria. You. Thank you.